Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. This happened in 1988 when I was remodeling my house. I had three carpenters staying in at the house so they could save on travel expenses and also so they could start work on time. The other workers opted to go home since they lived closer to the house. After about a week of work, my lead carpenter suddenly changed his mind and said they would rather go home each night than stay at the house. I asked them why, and here is his story. They were sleeping on the floor of the master bedroom, since it was the only one with carpeting. At around 2.30 a.m., he stood up to use the restroom, which was adjacent to my walk-in closet. You have to go through a door to get into the walk-in closet area and get to the restroom that also has a door. As he was doing this thing, he looked at the mirror at the end of a very short hallway for lack of a better term. There, he saw a lady was standing behind him. He looked over his shoulder, but there was no one there. When he looked at the mirror again, there she was, standing behind him. He ran towards the door to get out, but there was a strong force that was fighting with him as if not wanting him to leave the room at all. He finally gave a yell, and the other guy woke up, ran to see what was happening, and opened the door for him. There he was, in the corner, with his hands over his face, shaking. When he told the guys what had happened, they said it was best that they no longer stayed at the house. So, I had to let them go home every day from then on until the remodeling was done. Small children everywhere are often scared by whatever monster they imagine is in that cupboard in their bedroom. Little Joseph was no exception. He had told his parents on a number of occasions that he didn't want to sleep in his room because the thing in his cupboard might come out and get him. When his parents asked what the thing might be, he described it as a dark teddy bear. The house was relatively new, and neither parent had any reason to believe this was anything other than a child's imagination at work. Usually, children outgrow such fears, and his parents expected Joe to eventually forget about the monster in the cupboard as well. However, he didn't. If anything, he became even more terrified of the cupboard as he got older, and would often run headlong to his parents' bedroom in the night. His father, a friend of mine, would frequently show him that the cupboard was simply a cupboard filled with clothes. Joe would watch nervously from a safe distance, but remained unconvinced. On his eighth birthday, Joe was given his first camera. It was a kid's camera, but it was quite capable of taking both reasonable photographs and also short videos. 
He was excited to have the camera and spent much of the evening playing with it by taking photographs and videos of everything in sight, including himself. For once, Joe didn't even seem so reluctant to go to bed and to his own room. This was surprising because Joe would usually do almost anything to avoid going to bed in that room. His parents were very pleased that he went to his room, went to bed, and stayed there with little or no fuss or argument that night. However, as usual, at some point early in the morning, Joe came running into his parents' bedroom and squeezed himself in between them. At breakfast, Joe's father admonished Joe, who, at the age of eight, really shouldn't be sleeping with his parents. Joe pulled out his camera. I took a photo of the monster, Dad. You'll have to believe me now, he said. My friend took the camera his son was holding out to him. It was an orange plastic camera with blue buttons and a viewfinder. The small display screen on the back was lit up and sure enough, there was a picture there. He looked more closely at it. It looks like a shadow, he said, looking at Joe. It's a monster, Dad. It's a dark, horrid monster, and it tells me that it will take me away from you. Joe's father looked again at the screen. It was a shot from the bed towards that cupboard which was half open. The dark shadow was at one side of the cupboard. As he examined it more closely, he changed his mind. The dark shadow was peeking out from behind the cupboard door. How could that be? He said nothing, but instead focused Joe on getting ready for school. However, when Joe had left, he looked again at the photograph. There was something there, but what? He went up to Joe's room and examined the cupboard again. He opened it. He played with the curtains and the lamps in the room, trying to recreate what he saw in the photograph, but he could not. He began to feel a little uncomfortable. Could it be that there really was something inside the cupboard? He shook his head, dismissing the thought, and began to get ready to run an errand. It was then that he had an idea. It was a crazy idea, but still, it would settle things perhaps once and for all. He spent the next 30 minutes setting up his own video camera in Joe's bedroom. He switched it on and left. On his return a couple hours later, he took a quick look at the footage taken. There was nothing, just as he had expected. He chuckled to himself as, for a moment or two, he had actually began to think that there might actually be something in the cupboard. However, he reset the equipment and let it run for another hour or so while he made himself lunch. There was no harm in being thorough, he decided. He returned after lunch to find the camera switched off. Puzzled, he switched it back on and reviewed the video. A quick glance showed nothing unusual recorded, just as he had expected. But just as he was about to switch it off and pack up the equipment, he saw it. A sudden and distinct shadowy figure emanated from the cupboard, and a shadowy face looked into the camera lens just before the video ended abruptly as the camera was switched off. A chill ran up his spine. He rewound it. Yes, he hadn't imagined it. There was a shadow, wispy like smoke, and it rapidly grew in size before the video ended. Shaking, he packed the equipment, avoiding staring at the cupboard for the first time, slightly afraid of what he might see. Later in the evening, he reviewed the video with his wife. She sat wide-eyed in disbelief. Their son slept with them that night and every night thereafter, until they had moved from the house. There was, after all, a monster in the cupboard. In the 90s, in London, England, my daughter rented a house from a landlord. It was a two-bedroom as she has three children. Everything seemed fine at first, but her two youngest boys kept telling her that there was something nasty in the house. She didn't believe them and thought they were making it up. The house happened to be near a cemetery. 
One evening, after she had taken the children to bed, she told me that she came out of the bedroom and a great, big, black figure was standing just outside the door. It had no visible face. She said that it must have been an entity. She was terrified and it just gradually disappeared. Another time, she took a photo on her camera phone when she visited me. She said, look at that, mom. In the picture, the youngest child was on the sofa, but down near his feet was a small, hooded figure. And my grandson's eyes had been blackened out with black tape. My husband and I suggested that my daughter leave. She eventually agreed. Anyway, she moved into another house in London, and this time things were happening, but they seemed to be more friendly. I was there once when the children told her, Mom, there's a man in our bedroom playing ball with us. In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith, now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. In 2007, I lived in a little place in Benson, North Carolina. It was a Friday night because I had my shower and gotten dressed to get ready to go out. The music was playing on the internet and everything was normal. I had come from the back of the house to the living room. I went to the kitchen and grabbed a beer from the fridge and went into the living room and pulled out a cigarette. I had the beer in my left hand and the cigarette in my right. I sat down, and as soon as I touched the couch, I was gone into total darkness. There was no up or down, no left or right. It was the heaviest of darkness. It felt like a weight upon me, but I couldn't even see it myself. I felt an instant disconnect from God, as if He turned His back on me and all the guilt of everything I'd done wrong in my life came crushing upon me. I immediately thought, no, did I just die? All of a sudden, I burst into flames. Not around me, but I was burning inside the darkness. Yet it didn't hurt. I remember falling to my knees and praying to Jesus, please don't let this be it. In just that instant, I was back on my couch, and what seemed like forever was just a few minutes. A large brick structure with white trim and an imposing tower looms over the 1100 block of South 1st Street. Small, dormered windows accented in burgundy red peer down over the neighborhood from the pyramidal roof overhead. With its austere facade, four stories, and squat tower jutting skywards, it cuts a rather striking, albeit somewhat daunting, figure from the street level and when the occasional fog swells up from the Ohio River and rolls in to blanket the neighborhood in a billowy shroud of milky white, it joins the ranks of church steeples and bell towers that rise like needles above the dense haze and pierce the low-hanging sky over old Louisville. Although this impressive piece of architecture sits tucked away on a block seldom seen by visitors, it commands attention nonetheless and jealousy guards its spot in local history. 
Like most buildings in Old Louisville, 1135 South 1st Street has seen numerous past lives. And even though time has rubbed the slate of memory clean for many, the staid old structure harbors untold secrets and perhaps a disembodied spirit or two. The first time I saw the ghost, I almost fell over from shock, says Babette Phillips. A graduate of Bellarmine University, the 30-something lived more than three years in the large building, which has been converted into condominiums. When she moved into the spacious apartment on the second floor, Phillips never expected her quarters to come with its own ghost. If anyone had told me that they had seen the strange things I saw in that building, I wouldn't have believed them. I've always considered myself extremely skeptical of things like this. So when you actually experience a paranormal occurrence, it's quite a shock. And when the shoe's on the other foot, it really makes you stop and think. I'm a true believer now, but I don't expect people to believe it when I tell them I saw a ghost. And I really don't care to tell you the truth because I know what I saw and that's all I need. Babette's friends, on the other hand, told her what she really needed was an exorcist. It seems that once she saw the spirit, it grew attached to her and refused to leave the premises. I had been there for about a half year when I saw the ghost for the first time, and I had pretty much settled in and had everything unpacked and in its place, but I kept misplacing things and it was starting to get on my nerves, she recalls. I just assumed it was because I wasn't used to the layout of the apartment and was being forgetful. But then little things started to happen that made me think that maybe I wasn't being so forgetful after all. For example, when she would go to bed at night and place her glasses on the nightstand next to her side of the bed, she would awake the next morning to find they had been placed on the nightstand on the other side of the bed. The first time it happened, I figured I must have put them there before I went to bed or something because there's no way I would reach all the way across my king-size bed and put them on the table farthest away from me, Phillips explains. But when it kept happening over and over again, I knew something was up. Someone or something was moving my glasses to the other side of the bed while I slept. I always read before I fall asleep, and the last thing I do before turning out the lights is put my glasses down next to my book on the nightstand. Why would I reach across and put them on the other table? Not only that, Phillips claims an unseen force started to open and close doors in the various rooms of her unit. One day, I had just come out of the bathroom and walked into my bedroom when I suddenly heard a loud slam in the living room. I ran out to see what it was and it turned out to be the door leading into the guest bedroom. Mesmerized by the sight unfolding before her, Phillips says she stared as the door opened and then slammed shut with a loud bang three times in a row. Now, when it happens over and over like that, you know it cannot be the wind, she explains. Something had to actually pull the door open each time and then slam it shut, and I know I wasn't imagining that. On another occasion, loud noises drew the startled woman to the kitchen. One day, it sounded like someone was putting things away or something because I could hear the cupboard doors opening and closing, and it sounded like someone was pulling open the drawers and closing them, but they kept doing it over and over again. That's what made me nervous. Somewhat apprehensively, the young lady approached the entryway to the kitchen and careened her head around the corner, fearful of what she might actually see. You'll never believe it, she says. It was like an invisible person was in there opening and closing drawers and cupboards. It seemed like every single drawer and cabinet door was flying open and then closing again all on its own. It was one of the strangest sights I've ever beheld. When pressed as to her course of action after experiencing these initial disturbances, Phillips says, what are you supposed to do in a situation like that? Call the police? I don't think so. They'd cart you off to the loony bin if you did something like that. 
I just told myself there had to be a rational explanation for it and decided to grin and bear it. Besides, it wasn't like I was afraid or anything. For Babette Phillips, fear would come later on after she had her first sighting of the ghost at 1135 South 1st Street. So this went on for the first five, six months that I was in the condo. Every few weeks, something would happen. Doors would open by themselves and then slam shut before my very eyes, she recalls. My glasses would keep moving around on their own, things like that. One evening, I even thought I heard a young boy's voice coming from my bedroom, but I convinced myself that it had to be coming from a neighboring unit or something like that. Not too long after that, Phillips said she could perceive a palpable change in the atmosphere in her home. It was like all of a sudden the air in the place got very oppressive, very dark and gloomy. And I noticed I started to get depressed all the time. It was like the rooms were giving off some kind of bad energy or something. In addition to the negative vibes Phillips claimed the condo gave off, she claims she started to experience strange dreams as well. I guess I dream like any normal person does, but I usually didn't remember most of the dreams I would have, she explains. But not too long after the strange energy took over in the place, I started having these really weird dreams. Dreams like none I had ever had before. Although the dreams themselves contained no horrific images or frightening scenes, Phillips claimed they filled her with a sense of foreboding and despair and often left her mentally drained. Whenever I had these dreams, I'd wake up the next morning completely exhausted and depressed, and the dreams weren't really that strange because all I would see were these crowds of little kids looking at me, nothing else but it was like they were so sad and lonely, and that's the dark impression that stayed with me, all that sadness. When asked to give more details about the children from her dreams, she could only say that they appeared to be wearing old-fashioned clothing and they had absolutely no expressions on their faces, just these blank faces with these blank stares. Phillips also added that she could recall very little color from these odd dreams, only differing shades of gray, black, and white, and sad, pale faces. When she finally saw the ghost at 1135 South 1st Street, she would remember these sad, pale faces from her dreams. I had just come back from a walk around the neighborhood, she recalls, and I was sort of laughing to myself because on the street I had seen this old lady they call the Stick Witch. She's always got this shopping cart full of branches and stuff that she pushes around all the time, and there are all kinds of different stories as to who she is. A homeless lady, a real witch, a crazy person who escaped from an asylum, whatever. Some residents in the neighborhood also claimed to have seen her for decades, if not longer. Well, I was sort of smiling because she's always very friendly when I run into her and she always has something nice to say to me, although I've heard from others that's not always the case. Still, enjoying the warmth of the spring weather she was leaving outdoors, Phillips unlocked her door and walked into the living room. Slam! The door to her bedroom appeared to open and close on its own. It was a little creepy, I admit but I had sort of grown used to it, so I just shrugged it off and headed into the bathroom. She never anticipated what waited for her in the hallway outside the room. Right there, down the corridor a bit, was this little kid staring at me. Maybe about four feet tall, ten years old or so, I don't know, but he was just standing there looking at me. Phillips says she initially assumed that the child belonged to her sister, who sometimes arrived unannounced with children she would babysit. However, something gave her the impression that she had just had an encounter with a ghost. First off, the poor thing was all pale and sickly. Now I see where they get the phrase, white as a ghost from. It looked like a dead child almost. Second, and this is the creepiest part, 
I realized as it was staring at me that it didn't have any eyes. Just these black, black holes where the eyes should have been. And it's not that he had dark colored eyes. He didn't have any eyes at all, just these empty sockets. According to Phillips, she and the eerie apparition stood face to face in the hallway outside her bathroom for what seemed an eternity. I was just hoping it would disappear or something, but it never did, and I didn't know if I should speak to it or what. Finally, she says the ghostly figure of the little boy turned around and walked down the corridor. When it got to my bedroom door, which was closed, it just walked right through it and vanished from sight. Understandably, Phillips says she felt somewhat nervous about opening the door to her bedroom. I half expected him to be inside waiting for me when I got up the courage to open the door and venture inside, but no one was there. I guess that's a good thing. Phillips claims she encountered the same apparition on four different occasions after the initial encounter. Things kept moving around the house, and I would constantly hear slamming and footsteps, but the worst was when the little boy would show himself in the hallway, she recounts. I realized he wasn't a malevolent spirit or anything, but I didn't exactly get a happy vibe from him either. It was a real haunting, I guess, because I always had a haunted feeling afterwards. Those dark slots where the eyes should have been were truly haunting. Although the ghostly manifestation had acquired a normal routine of appearing in the hallway and then turning around and walking through the door to Babette's bedroom, she does recall one instance in which the wraith deviated from its usual habit. It was the second to the last time that I saw him, she explains, and I had anticipated him because the door in the living room kept opening and shutting, more insistent than usual. Hesitantly, she turned the corner and entered the corridor to find the ghost there as she had on previous occasions. There he was, as usual, just standing there and staring in my direction with those awful empty eye sockets. I could feel the air charged with energy, too. The fuzz on the back of my neck was standing straight up, and an icy chill filled the room. You could even see my breath come out as I was breathing. Despite the ominous signs, Phillips claims she didn't feel threatened by the strange sight before her. Like I said, I had started to feel sorry for the little guy because I felt as if he wanted to tell me something or communicate with me in some form, and I decided to try and get a little closer to him. So I decided to take a step towards him and see what would happen. According to Phillips, the ghostly figure threw its hands up as if in sheer terror and bolted away from her. He put his hands up over his face like he was covering his eyes and then he ran away. That was the only time I actually tried to get close. By this point in time, Philip's close friends had heard about the strange goings-on in the looming building at 1135 South 1st Street, and some urged her to consult a priest or medium who could help rid the premises of the phantom boy. I didn't want to get rid of him, though. That's what they didn't understand. I wasn't afraid of him, and I didn't feel threatened, so I didn't think it was a big deal or anything. Although she readily admits that the eerie apparition had disconcerted her on more than one occasion, Phillips says she had acquired a certain affinity for the young specter. Yes, all that slamming and the noises spooked me, and yes, when I saw those vacant sockets for eyes, it did give me the willies, but at no time did I feel frightened for my life or anything. I did get some negative vibes, but my gut instinct told me I would be fine. Her friends, on the other hand, refused to buy this argument and insisted that she entail the services of someone qualified in parapsychological matters. They were really afraid for me and basically made someone come over and check the place out. I refused to have a Catholic priest come over because I was afraid that he would scare the little boy away so we settled on someone who claimed to have psychic powers. Phillips knew of someone with purported extrasensory abilities through her mother and decided to go with him. Since I hadn't even told my mother any details about my experiences, other than I had seen an apparition, 
I felt reasonably comfortable that this guy would come in with no prior knowledge of the situation. He wasn't a bona fide medium or anything, as far as I knew, and he was very young, so I was a bit skeptical. But Phillips says the amateur psychic quickly changed her mind. As soon as the guy entered my place and started walking around, I got the feeling that he was picking up on something, she recalls. The first thing he did was to walk through the living room and to the hallway where he stopped outside my bedroom. According to Phillips, the sensitive immediately raised his hands to his eyes and held them there for a moment or two. And the first thing he said was that he was getting a strong impression about something to do with eyes. Phillips says her blood turned cold in an instant. I hadn't told anyone about the little boy's eyes at all, she explains. I was the only one in the whole wide world who even knew that. I was totally amazed when he pointed that out after being in the apartment for not even a minute. After that revelation, Phillips says the psychic entered her bedroom and seemed to walk about in a trance-like state. Jim, that was the guy's name, walked around in a wide circle and then told us he could sense the spirit of a young boy and that he used to live in the area where my bedroom was. Intrigued, Phillips decided to ask a question of the young medium. I was just about to ask if he knew how old the little boy was when, all of a sudden, he just spun around as if he had read my mind and said, he's young, very young, only eight or nine years old. You can imagine my shock at that. Jim then continued to make his way through the apartment and reported that he had received impressions from other children as well, but he couldn't give many details other than there used to be a lot of children in this house. Within ten minutes, he had made the rounds and sat himself down on a sofa in the living room. I was really eager to get more information from him, but he told me that he wasn't picking up as much as he usually would in that kind of situation. He said he knew there were children involved, but he wasn't getting many details for some reason. All he could say was that there was a lot of sadness. Grateful for the information she had received, Phillips says the young psychic left after another half hour and some idle chit-chat. He offered to come back and try again sometime, saying that some days are better than others for this kind of thing, but I never got around to calling him back. I received an email from Babette not too long after this visit from the psychic named Jim and about six months before she moved to California. It was late 2005. By that point, the book I had been working on was in the bookstore and I was amazed at the amount of publicity it had generated for the neighborhood. I hope you don't mind me getting in touch with you, she wrote, but I just read your book Ghosts of Old Louisville and was wondering if you knew anything about 1135 South 1st Street. I've experienced unexplained sounds there and also had several sightings of a young boy who I believe is a ghost. A psychic recently informed me that he could sense the presence of a young child here as well. Have you heard about the place being haunted at all? Any information you would have would be greatly appreciated. I hadn't heard anything about 1135 South 1st Street, so, as I usually do, I got the dogs leashed and took a stroll over to identify the building. As I made my way down the block toward 1135, a wide smile spread as I spied the building that I had seen so many times before. Although I didn't recognize the street number per se, I had always admired the stately Italianate building for the squat tower that soared over all the other roofs in the neighborhood. Like other buildings in Old Louisville, this brick structure looked like the kind to have a ghost story, and I was happy to hear that someone had made it official. Before I responded to the email, I decided to do some research and see what secrets I could dig up about the past lives of the brick giant. Although I had come across an interesting old photo of the building with an intriguing identifying caption underneath, while doing research one day at the Filson Historical Society, I decided to verify what I knew about the current residents of Babette Phillips. I made my way to the Jefferson County Courthouse and began rummaging around in the deed room to see what I could find. As very often happens, tracking the deeds of the property back to the original owners of the land proved to be a bit of a challenge, so I decided to enlist the help of John Schuler, 
a friend and fellow writer who also happened to be a title examiner. After poring through aging documents and deciphering the perplexing connections from one deed to the next, he was able to confirm my original hunch. The building at 1135 South 1st Street at one time had been an orphanage. The caption I had read at the Filson Historical Society identified it simply as the Old Orphan's Home, but I had suspected that this wasn't the official name of the institution. With John Schuler's help, I discovered that the original deeds identified the property as belonging to the Jewish Welfare Federation. After consulting the Encyclopedia of Louisville, I learned that the old orphanage on First Street had been known as the Jewish Children's Home at one time. I shared this information with Babette over lunch at the Third Avenue Cafe at the corner of Third and Oak, just half a block from my house on a blustery autumn day. The original Jewish Children's Home had been established on December 4, 1910 at 223 Jacob Street and then moved to 1233 Garvin in 1912 and remained there till 1922. In that year, it moved to the First Street location and stayed there until 1933. What was hard to discern from the deeds is whether the building had been built expressly as an orphanage or whether the structure already occupied that plot of land. Although the architectural style clearly suggests an older structure, the deed implies that two plots had been acquired with the express intent of providing for an orphanage for Jewish children in the neighborhood in 1922. Whether the building actually went up before that year is inconsequential, I suppose, since Babette at least had a possible source for the haunting in her condo. Not only that, I had also gleaned from the Encyclopedia of Louisville that the old orphanage had also served as a convalescent home for children after it shut its doors in 1933. For more than 40 years till it closed in 1975, the stately brick building at 1135 South 1st Street harbored numbers of sickly children under its roof. That has to be why I was having all those weird dreams about the kids just standing around looking at me with all those sickly faces and all that negative energy," she said as I divulged this information between bites of fried portobello mushroom dipped in horseradish sauce. I'm sure being an orphanage all those years and then a hospital for sick kids left some negative energy in that space. There must have been a lot of sad kids around there. Satisfied with the history of the old red brick building at 1135 South 1st Street, Babette finished her meal and we said our goodbyes. After our meeting at the cafe, I didn't really expect to hear from her again. But several days before Christmas, as a blanket of powdery white carpeted the entire neighborhood, I got a call from her. You'll never guess what, she said. I've got a picture with the apparition of the little boy in it, she gushed. My cousin was here the other day, and she took some pictures here and there, and one of them, where you can see the hallway in the background, is a cloudy figure in the shape of a boy. It looks just like the apparition I've been seeing. She wanted me to see it, and we agreed that we'd meet sometime after New Year's once the holiday hubbub had subsided. Christmas came and went. New Year's was very uneventful, and on January 6, Epiphany, I went and paid Phillips a visit in her First Street condominium. She greeted me at the door with a crestfallen expression. "'Come on in,' she said half-heartedly. "'You're never going to believe what happened. I don't have the picture anymore.' I walked inside and Babette explained what had happened. "'My cousin's sort of religious,' she said. And the day she was here and took that picture with her digital camera, she got really freaked out when she saw that form in the photo, and it was obvious right away that there was a little boy standing there. But her church teaches that anything like that is associated with the devil and is wrong, so she got really nervous. I told her not to worry about it and asked her for a copy, and she told me she'd get one to me the following day, so I thought everything was going to be hunky-dory. From the tone in Babette's voice, I could tell that her cousin had had a change in heart about the picture and refused to let her have a copy. So she doesn't get in touch the next day or the day after that, so I call and see what's going on, and then she tells me she's not going to give me the photograph. In fact, 
she had already deleted it from her camera. When I prodded as to the actual reason for not handing over the picture, Babette explained. She went and spoke with her pastor, and he told her it was an evil photograph that needed to be destroyed, so she deleted it from the memory card and tore up the one copy she had. She told me, all smug-like and everything, she was going to have no part in promoting the dark side. She knew I wanted to show you the picture for your book, too. The distressed woman shrugged her shoulders and sat down. My cousin never was the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, she exclaimed with a sigh. It was such a cool picture, too, she added. The image was pretty clear and looked just like a little boy standing there, just like the little boy I had seen. And as with the little boy I had seen, you couldn't see his eyes. It was so creepy. All you could see in the picture were these big black holes where his eyes should have been. I can't believe that even showed up on the camera. Babette and I chatted about random things for the next half hour or so, and then I left to go and prepare dinner for the Thursday night dinner club. Several hours later, we all sat by the fire in the front parlor, nursing mugs of mulled wine and hot cider as an icy wind roared outside. Soon, we were passing around steaming bowls of turkey and sweet potato dumplings, and the frigid temperatures outside were all but forgotten. For dessert, there were bourbon balls and cups of strong black coffee for fortification, and just before the stroke of midnight, everyone said their goodbyes, gathered their things, and left. As I watched the last of them leave in the bitter night wind, my mind raced back to that afternoon's meeting with Babette, and the goose flesh on my bare arms wasn't provoked by the freezing darkness outside. I was thinking about the apparition of the ghostly little boy with the empty eyes. Just then the phone rang. It was Babette Phillips. You won't believe the visit I just had, she said, apparently unaware that it was midnight. This old woman came and talked to me, and she identified the little boy I've been seeing. I sat on the bottom step of the stairs in the foyer and waited for her to continue. I was out on a date tonight and got back around 10.30, she explained. I got out of the car and was coming up the front walk when I noticed someone standing on the sidewalk looking up at the building. At first, I couldn't tell if it was a man or woman, someone young or old, whatever. I just assumed it was a homeless person and ignored it. Phillips says she then ran the flight of stairs up to her condo, discarded her coat and hat, and made ready for bed. I went to close the curtains in my living room, she said, when I noticed this person was still out on the sidewalk looking up at my window. It made me a bit nervous, so I kept an eye out for five or ten minutes and it became apparent that this person was not going to budge from that spot on the sidewalk. Phillips then got dressed, put on her coat, and ran down to face the stranger. I went down the steps to the sidewalk, and it was like the person didn't even notice me coming as I approached. When I got close enough, I could see it was an elderly woman, and she didn't appear to be homeless at all. She looked nicely dressed and everything, so I said, "'Excuse me, is there something I can help you with?' Well, this startled her because she wasn't expecting me. According to Phillips, the woman jumped a bit and gathered her coat tighter around her. She told me she was sorry for staring, and she explained that she used to live in my building and pointed up at my window. This intrigued me, so I invited her inside, and she readily accepted. When Phillips asked why the lady was out so late by herself, she responded that she had lost track of time and must have been standing there for two or three hours. It wasn't that late when she got there, I guess, but she had just lost track of time. She must have been daydreaming. Babette made the woman, a New Jersey resident named Mrs. Weinberg, a cup of tea and sat down next to her as the visitor shared an interesting story. Mrs. Weinberg told me that she and her twin brother had both been wards of the state under the auspices of the Jewish Welfare Federation and that they had ended up in the orphanage in 1930, the year after the big stock market crash. She didn't know for sure, but I think her father lost everything and died because of it, leaving them all on their own. The father had a sister out west, supposedly, but they couldn't find her, so that's how they ended up in the orphanage. According to Mrs. Weinberg, their mother had died of tuberculosis just two years after they were born. She said they were five years old when they arrived at the orphanage, and things were fine at first. 
They were treated very well and, all things considered, they were relatively happy. The only problem was that they couldn't find anyone to adopt the both of them and keep them together. So they stayed on in the orphanage for another three years until a terrible accident would separate them forever. I felt so sorry for Mrs. Weinberg as she was telling me all this, said Babette, because I could tell it was painful for her to relive the past and she must have been 80 years old or so. There were a couple of times when she was on the verge of tears as she told me this, that poor woman. According to Babette, Sarah Weinberg and her twin brother Harold had discovered various nooks and crannies around the orphanage in the years they called it home. She says they used to sneak up to the tower room and that they had a secret way to get down to the cellar as well, and they used to hide out in a janitorial closet that was somewhere in the vicinity of my condo. I tried to find out where the closet was exactly, but Mrs. Weinberg said she couldn't be sure but she thought it was in the hallway area somewhere or maybe where my bedroom was. I guess they had made some changes to the layout since the time she had been there. She did remember it was close to the window that looks out over the street from my living room, though. With tears in her eyes, the old woman went on to tell of the tragic mishap that would claim the life of her twin brother. So she told me her brother had this awful accident and ended up dying from it. But when she told me the exact details... My blood ran cold, explained Phillips. I hugged the phone closer to my ear and used a free hand to rub away the goosebumps along my arm. They supposedly liked to play hide-and-seek around this old janitor's closet they had discovered, and it got to be their own special little spot where they would come to when they were upset or to share secrets and things like that. Well, one day, they both ran into the closet, but they didn't know that the custodian had left a large pail of undiluted bleach in the middle of the floor. The little boy tripped and landed head first in the bucket of bleach. All of a sudden, the goosebumps were back in full force and I could feel them spreading to my back. The bleach blinded him, said Babette. That's why he didn't have eyes whenever I saw him. He was blind. According to Mrs. Weinberg, her brother, although blinded for life, most likely would have made a speedy recovery were it not for one thing. The orphanage made plans to institutionalize him in a special school for the visually impaired. That meant that he and his sister would have to be separated, said Phillips. Isn't that awful? When he found that out, the poor thing took a turn for the worse and just lay in bed and wasted away till he died a week or two later. He didn't want to live without his sister and just decided to die instead. Now, I've got this ghost in my condominium to prove it. According to Babette, Sarah Weinberg eventually found an adoptive family in New Jersey and grew to be a happy young girl, although sad memories of her twin brother would haunt her for the rest of her life. After she went to college and married, she made a vow to return to Louisville every five years to visit the old orphanage where she and Harold had known a time of relative contentment and security together. I was never able to talk to Sarah Weinberg in person, so I had to accept Babette Phillips at her word before she left Kentucky for California, but I hope they both made it back to old Louisville for another visit to the old orphan's home. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash built, promo code WeirdDarkness.
As a young child, I think I was actually quite an innocent. Perhaps I was a tad overprotected by my parents, or perhaps I was just wired that way. To be honest, I do not know. I do know, though, that I had, and to some degree still do have, an imagination. My imagination was so strong that I constantly drew other children into my fantasy land. And when I left that fantasy, even momentarily, they stopped playing there too. It was as if I were the catalyst for whatever fantasy we built. It was I who built layer upon layer of substance out of sticks, dust bins, stones, and such. I would often delay having to go to the bathroom simply because I knew that on my return the fantasy would be lost, gone forever. Looking back, it was as if I created and wove the dance we danced in my childhood reality. And perhaps I did. I dreamed well, too. Better then than now. Lucid dreaming, something I find difficult these days, came naturally to me then. I would willfully continue a dream night after night, picking up right where I recalled leaving off. One dream was about a girl. She lived in a castle-like house on an island. It was a small island with steep cliffs all around, and it started as I found a cave and worked my way up to find the house. The house had tall, forbidding stone walls and was partially fortified with archer turrets on each corner. Looking in through a window, I saw a girl. She was beautiful, and I fell in love with her as soon as my eyes saw her. She was my age in the dream, six or seven perhaps. She looked so very sad, and I wondered how such a pretty girl living in such a magnificent house could be so sad. One day, she caught sight of me. We made signs and faces through the window. She even smiled, but she kept looking around nervously. She would shoo me away at times, and I would hide and spy as a witch-like lady entered the room and the girl would cry. I eventually discovered that the witch-like lady was an evil old hag who practiced black magic in the basement and caves below the house. She abused the girl who was her niece. I discovered the girl's parents had died, leaving her in the care of this wicked aunt. As the dream continued, the girl would secretly let me in and we would play happily in that room until the aunt came. Then I would hide or leave, or hide and then leave, my heart pounding like a drum. In the end, I was, of course, discovered and caught. The girl and I were taken to the basement and we were tied up. Somehow we escaped and turned the tables on the wicked witch, ridding the world of her via her own evil magic once and for all. The girl was free, she was happy and smiled, and we would play until, eventually, the dreams stopped. These dreams took place over an extended period of time, and if you analyze them, they have elements of all fairy tales, don't they? the wicked witch, the sad and mistreated niece or stepdaughter, and the prince who frees the girl and, in the end, marries her. The prince is the part of me that faces and confronts something within me, the evil old witch, and defeats it in order to reconcile other aspects of myself. When I look back now at my childhood, I wonder at how magical it really was. I wonder at the abilities I seem to have lost or misplaced as I have grown older and become a part of another world. Imagination is a precarious commodity, and the art of dreaming is a wonderful and magical tool to heal oneself. I am convinced at times that I really lost something growing up, something truly magical, some gift I was born with, perhaps we all have. You see, the problem is that the moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. J.M. Barry's Peter Pan has some interesting quotes throughout, in my opinion, that now resonate both with me and the world that I live in. Just consider the following and perhaps you will agree. Never say goodbye, because goodbye means going away, and going away means forgetting. 
You know that place between sleeping and awake. That place where you can still remember dreaming. That's where I'll always think of you. All the world is made of faith and trust and pixie dust. The thing I miss about being a child is my Peter Pan. Every one of us has a Peter Pan within us, and we lose him growing up. Some of us never realize it nor care, but others like me keep looking and searching for Neverland, knowing that not only does it exist, but I once went there all of the time. When I was 15 years old, living in Benson, North Carolina, I used to sleep on a sofa bed that sat in front of my bedroom window. I was laying on the sofa and the moon showed in the window bright. My TV sat on a stand across the room. For some reason, I was having trouble going to sleep. The TV was on and the volume was up. I closed my eyes for about 30 seconds and opened to them, thinking I have school in the morning, I've got to sleep. I did the same thing again. On the third time, closing my eyes and opening them, the TV looked like it was in a distance, and the volume was way off and in an echo. I thought, what in the world? When I went to get up, I couldn't move anything but my head. I became afraid. I turned my head towards the window and solid black figures sat on the back of my sofa looking down over me. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. All I could do was close my eyes and cry. When I opened my eyes, everything was back to normal. I jumped up, turned on all the lights, and ran upstairs to my mom's room. Last year, I was a camp counselor at a Salvation Army camp in Wisconsin. This was during teen camp. One of the girl campers brought a Ouija board with her. One night, she started using it to call spirits. Some of the staff felt the repercussions. That night, all of us felt a very evil presence on the campus grounds. One staff member even went into our laundry room when no one was in there and heard and saw the back closet door slam. Two of our staff were chasing some of our campers who were being mischievous out in the woods that night. They saw what looked like blurry human shadows. One of them was even standing over my friend. Some of us even heard the bell ring when no one was over there. After that camp, our bosses went into the girls' cabin and just prayed over it for a while. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.